To the north, it borders the Democratic Republic of the Congo. To the east, Zambia. And to the south, Namibia. Thus far, I have mentioned three countries bordering Angola. The Democratic Republic of the Congo, Zambia, and Namibia. But it's actually four. This is because Angola has an exclave to the north, the province of Gabinda, which borders not just the Democratic Republic of the Congo, but also the second Congo, the Republic of Congo. Angola's geography is dominated by four principal natural regions. The arid coastal lowlands, stretching from Namibia to Luanda, vegetated hills and mountains rising inland from the coast into a great escarpment, a large high plateau consisting of dry savanna, which extends eastward and southeast from the escarpment, and rainforest in the north and the exclave of Cabinda. Several significant rivers originate from the Angolan Highlands. Among them are the Guena River, which I've gotten to see in person and which forms the border between Angola and Namibia, the Kwango River, which partly forms the border between Angola and the DRC, and the longest river of Angola, the Kwanda River, which flows into the Atlantic just south of the capital. It was along this river, the Kwanza, that the Mbundu people, a Bantu and Kimbundu speaking ethnic group, settled and later formed the kingdom of Ndonga. According to early tradition, Ndonga was founded from the Congo Kingdom, probably in the late 15th or early 16th century, as a territory state. Ndonga's kings bore the title Ngola, which later gave its name to the Portuguese colony of Angola. The history of the Ndongo Kingdom is tightly intertwined with the most powerful state to develop in the region, the Congo Kingdom. It developed in the 14th century and was probably a loose federation of small polities. But as the kingdom expanded, conquered territories were integrated as a royal patrimony. The Portuguese arrival in 1483 brought Christianity to the kingdom, which the king, along with his son, adopted in 1491. Portugal and the kingdom had soon forged close diplomatic and economic ties. In subsequent years, Congo was increasingly challenged by rivals from the east and was eventually restored with Portuguese assistance. In exchange, Congo allowed the Portuguese to establish a colony at Luanda Island next to Ndongo in 1575. At first, the Portuguese cooperated with Ndongo, even serving as mercenaries in Ndongo's army. But relations quickly turned sour when it was revealed that Portugal intended to take over all of Ndongo. The resulting war forced the Congo to intervene and save the Portuguese forces. Consequent wars, with occasional Ndongo and Portuguese victories, lasted until 1621, when Ndongo Mbandi sent his sister Jinga Mbandi to negotiate a peace, having lost his capital. The resultant peace treaty meant for Ndongo to become a Portuguese vassal, paying 100 enslaved people per year as a tribute. The treaty, however, was never honored by the Portuguese. Ngola Mbandi took his own life as a result. This image depicts Jinga's embassy to Luanda to negotiate peace. Noteworthy is that she was not provided with a chair to humiliate her, which is why she is seated on the back of one of her servants. Ndonga continued her wars against the Portuguese at some point, following the Dutch invasion of Brazil, even allied with the Dutch to win some battles, who, by the way, ended up ruling Luanda for seven years. The conflict between the Portuguese colony and Queen Ndongo culminated in 1656, when a peace was reached between the exhausted parties, resulting in mutual recognition by each side and cooperation and a lucrative slave trade. Shinga's death in 1663 led to ceremonies among both the Portuguese and Mbundu, and she soon found her way into oral traditions and became a powerful symbol of Angolan resistance during the Angolan War of Independence. She remains an icon of Angolan history until today, with her being remembered as the mother of Angola, 
and Netflix creating a mini-series about a life in 2023. It must be said, however, that the series is vastly inaccurate, as it, for example, depicts her as someone who wishes to abolish the slave trade, when in reality, she profited greatly from it and had many slaves herself. For centuries, Portuguese control was largely limited to the coastal regions. The interior remained under the control of African kingdoms, like the discussed Congo, Ndongo, and Telunda. However, by the late 19th century, Portugal sought to expand its control inland, driven by European competition, especially with Britain, Belgium, and Germany. The resulting Berlin Conference intended to settle European ambitions peacefully, formalized the partition of Africa, and arbitrarily allocated land to European powers, even though they, in practice, didn't even control these territories. Until 1606, with the introduction of the systematic taxation of Africans, the Portuguese focused exclusively on administering areas with plantations and railways. Only by 1920, all but the remote southeast of the colony were firmly under Portuguese control. The once mighty kingdoms were abolished and the Portuguese worked directly through chiefs, headmen and African policemen. A new class of Creoles, descendants of both African and Portuguese ancestry, took over many aspects of public administration. In the following decades, more and more Portuguese settled in Angola and took over most of these public administration roles and Creoles, once recognized as Portuguese, had to prove the status as an assimilated person through stringent tests. Old economic sectors of slavery and ivory had by now been replaced with the exports of sugar, coffee, palm products and increasingly cotton for Portuguese textile mills. In addition, the diamond and fishing industry were emerging. Angolan natives, those who could not prove to be assimilated, were taxed and subjected to brutal forced labor and forced cultivation in the new economic sectors. On January 4th, 1961, a revolt began in Baisha de Casania by workers from a Belgian multinational company involved in the production of cotton. The resulting crackdown led to the deaths of several hundred workers and would lay a path to the ensuing independence struggle. There were three major parties involved in the struggle for Angolan independence. The Movimento Popular de Liberação de Angola, short MPLA, received support from the clandestine Portuguese Communist Party and Soviet Union and enjoyed popularity among some Rwandans and rural Mbundu. After 1964, the operations were based out of a newly independent Zambia. Next, the Frente Nacional de Liberação de Angola, short FNLA, received support from the United States and China. The FNLA enjoyed support in Congo, where it was based, and some similarly rural support from the Mbundu populations. The third movement, the Unio Nacional para a Independencia Total de Angola, short UNITA, in contrast had a predominantly of Mbundu leadership and some support from the Chokwe and Ovambo. Of these three movements, UNITA received the least foreign backing and lacked the base outside of Angola. With time, however, the internal divisions and occasional armed conflicts among the three movements enabled the Portuguese to gain the upper hand by the early 1970s. Luck, however, turned in 1974 with the coup against Salazar and his Estado Nuevo military dictatorship. Tired of the colonial wars, and by now largely the last European power to hold on to its colonies in Africa, Lisbon moved swiftly to negotiate independence in its African colonies. Portugal was thus set to hand over the power to the three independence movements, which had agreed to form a coalition government following a general election in the country's independence on the 11th of November 1975. The ensuing ceasefire, however, was abused by all sides to secure strategic positions, acquire more arms, and enlarge the militant forces. Both the US and Soviet Union began pouring weapons into the country. By the time of independence, the Portuguese left Angola without formally handing power to any movement, and nearly all the European settlers fled the country. The MPLA soon controlled the capital with the significant help from Cuban forces and a sophisticated weaponry. In response, UNITA and the FNLA set up a rival government with the aid of South Africa, which was defeated with even more Cuban assistance. The conflict between UNITA and the MPLA 
lasted from the months before their independence in 1975 until February 2002. It took a total of 27 years after many broken peace agreements, failed negotiations and rigged elections in 1992 for lasting peace to materialize with the death of Jonas Savimbi, the UNITA leader from its inception in 1966 until 2002. 27 years of civil war left the government with the challenge of rebuilding a country that largely no longer existed. Since the independence, the MPLA has not lost a single election and remains in power until this day. Freedom House gives the country a 10 out of 40 in terms of political rights. Freedom House additionally reports that the MPLA, aligned economic oligarchies, have nurtured a system of dependency and patronage that can subvert candidates and voters' ability to freely express their political choices. Angola's economy today is largely based on the export of crude oil. It is the second largest oil producer in Africa after Nigeria, and the commodity represents 64% of tax revenues and over 95% of exports in Angola in 27, according to the IMF. Even though Angola produces vast quantities of oil, it does not even refine enough to meet a fraction of domestic demand. Domestic oil prices are thus high, as petroleum has to be imported at a premium. Angola today ranks among the countries with the lowest economic complexity, meaning that the economy mostly just digs stuff out of the ground and sells it on the international market. As a consequence, Angola needs to import even the most simple of things. Due to this, a fast food hamburger in Rwanda has at times cost a bizarre $20, with only a small economic and political elite being able to afford that. Angola's Gini today ranks among the top 10 most unequal countries in the world, with high levels of corruption. Being so dependent on oil has not just resulted in no economic diversification, but also resulted in an unreliable currency, the Kwanza. This name should sound familiar, as it is named after a river that we have discussed earlier. The currency has to be managed through a float exchange rate system, with the Central Bank of Angola, Banco Nacional de Angola, BNA influences the value of the Kwanza by intervening in the foreign exchange market as the dependency on oil would otherwise result in excessive volatility. Propping up the Kwanza was no longer possible in 2023 as oil revenues were lower than expected and the central bank was forced to depreciate the Kwanza by 40% against the dollar. I might have made things look rather bleak because they largely are. Angola is one of the few countries not involved in a war where the SDGs score has improved extremely slowly or even stagnated since the year 2000. Noteworthy exceptions are the SDG 12 and 13. 12, responsible consumption and production, is deemed to be achieved. 13, climate action, is in track to be achieved. And this despite significant fossil fuel exports which are taken into consideration. I guess lacking any kind of advanced economy is largely of help here. On a different note, what Angola might miss in terms of SDG progress, it more than makes up for, with its music scene, beautiful landscape and Portuguese influenced food. Overall, I can't wait to visit Angola. Yeah.